So uh, going to give a quick TLDR to sort of let you know where we're going with this talk, uh, and then we'll spend the rest of the talk unspooling that. Um, and I would love to get sort of like questions and pings from the audience as we're going. So if you want to toss those in the chat, I can see it monitoring it. Um, we'll try and answer it directly. Um, it's probably we'll have a live verbal Q&A at the end. So probably text chat while the talk is going and and audio chat uh, afterwards. OK, so. What's the TLDR of this uh, UX for Louis uh, kind of uh, this? Uh, yeah, what's what's our what's our outline? So the key thesis here is that one thing that large language models have done is unlock a new type of user interface, the language user interface. And like all user interfaces, language inter interfaces need good design. This is what makes uh, in what makes them better, uh, one better than another design um, as much or maybe more than engineering. And right now, kind of the design anti patterns are emerging first. So I'm going to focus on those in this talk um, and talk about some of the most important anti patterns that have come up. Um, but I will talk about some. It's not just going to be haterism. Uh, we'll also have a, a look at GitHub Copilot and its design process, which is kind of like a master class in how this should be done. Um, and then I'll close out with like a little teaser of what I think is one of the most interesting problems on the like three to five year time scale, which is language user, user interface design for robots. All right. So, um, and the uh, LLMs are. Uh, LMs are this new technology that has unlocked kind of like a new um, style of user interface, uh, the language user interface. Uh, so like back in the 70s, the sort of uh, original interface for uh, for personal computers was this terminal user interface, also a text user interface where you're um, kind of uh, you know, the computer displays text to you, you type text into it. Uh, that's, you know, this um, like very simple interface. It's still the interface that we use when we're working at the like infrastructural layer of building applications. Uh, and the, um, uh, as that was, you know, that was a usable interface and people got excited about personal computers from that. Uh, but it wasn't, you know, it was not a, it, it was not a great interface. It was not that ergonomic of an interface. It requires a ton of specialization uh, to learn how to use that, that terminal interface. Um, and in the eighties, um, the like sort of hot new thing on the block was this, uh, was graphical user interfaces, user interfaces where the computer displays an image to you, you interact with that image sort of like in this very spatial way, you move around in the image, you adjust things. Um, and this graphical user interface was a key part of what made personal computers something that people wanted to like actually use. Uh, Charles, just a reminder, we try to keep the presentations not more than 25 minutes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, like in the, you know, in the 90s, we moved on, uh, we, uh, the sort of elaboration of the World Wide Web, uh, like opened up a new way to use computers that that was focused on links between uh, between pages. And so this like graphical user interface moved into the browser for uh, a lot of development. Uh, the uh, moving forward, sort of like the next big innovation in user interfaces was mobile user interfaces. So now this is something that like travels along with the person that is like physically interact. Uh, you can physically interact with it. It's a graphical interface as well, but like much more physical. Uh, you have things like accelerometers, you have position, you have uh, you have touch. So each of these is opening up new opportunities for application development, new ways to sort of deliver value to people. Um, and now in the in the 2020s, we're sort of starting to see a new type of user interface developing a user interface that uh, in which you kind of like type things that you that you want you describe what you want in natural language, and then you kind of you like get that thing. So Adept um, promises to be able to do things like, um, you know, uh, help you buy a house. Uh, and not and just by you typing, like, find me a house that looks like this, the kind of the way you might send an email to a personal assistant. And 
so the question, you know, what is this? What is this interface? What is, um, uh, you know, what uh, this interface doesn't necessarily have a name yet. Um, Sam Altman sort of asked about this back in back in April, like, what should we call this new interface that's coming about? Um, and uh, one of the names that he liked and that I like is language interface, so language user interface. Um, this is something that people, as these other types of interfaces were being built, people were always trying to build this language interface going back to the like 60s even. Um, so famous, there, there's some like famous things from the past back it, uh, like this uh, early in the top right uh, like virtual robot that you could direct by typing things like pick up a big red block and it would pick it up for you. That's Shirdlu um, from Stanford. Um, and early search engines were presented as a language interface to the internet. Um, so this is something people have tried for a long time. Why is it possible now? Um, like why it wasn't possible in the past because it's hard to understand language. Um, but thanks to the creation of like large language models, uh, which um, learn by guessing the like next word to appear in a sentence, uh, this it's now possible for a computer to understand those kinds of like loose uh, semantic information in uh uh in commands like you know pick up a big red block uh and so uh language models have learned to do things like write python they've learned about chemistry they've uh and they've learned about tons of things just by solving that problem and that allows them to run a language user interface but like all user interfaces language user interfaces need like good design um that's uh that's like a critical piece. And right now there's not been that much focus on it. If you go on the, uh, if you go on Twitter or, or whatever, you're going to see a lot of people talking about like, oh, I got, you know, I got this thing to work. I got like something that can book me a flight. Um, I've got a language model that will like uh, filter my spam calls. And like at this time, a lot of those applications are in what Alan Cooper would call the like dancing bear phase um, where the, uh, and the analogy here is this like, classic circus act of like a bear that you uh, that can like dance. It doesn't dance very well, but it's surprising that a bear can dance. And it's interesting to some people that a bear can dance. Um, but that doesn't make it, you know, as uh, good of an experience as watching a talented human dancer. Um, but right now, everybody's like got their dancing bear. They're excited about it and they're posting it, um, you know, to share on on ML Twitter. Uh, so if we want to make the, uh, you know, if we want to move past the dancing bear phase and to the phase where uh, these things are actually, you know, enjoyable to use, uh, like pleasant to use, we need, uh, we don't want to do this sort of like engineering centered or bear centered design. Um, we want human centered design. So there's a really great book on this that, uh, you know, I and many others highly recommend the design of everyday things by Don Norman. Uh, so just to pull out like some of the most important pieces from this for understanding language user interface design, um, the maybe the most important piece is that you want to align what you show people your system can do and what your system can actually do. So those are the like signifiers of what your system can do and the affordances, the things that your system uh, that your that like it actually does. So if you look at these two doors, the one on the left has a sign that says pull and it has two bars. These bars, that's something that's easy to grab and pull on. Um, but and the doors on the right have the same kind of bars on them, but they have a sign that says push. So on the left, the the sign signifies the same thing that the, the system can actually do. Um, and on the right with these push doors, um, there's a misalignment. The sign says uh, that you should push, but the handles like clearly seem to say like pull me. Um, and so you want to in like your documentation, in the text around your system, in the way that you design your system, you want to align these two things. Um, so we don't want to be designing uh, systems that are the, the same as this door. Uh, and a lot of the time, the, the way that you signify something is just a matter of convention. So like a green button means go do something, a red button means stop. And that doesn't really, you know, there's not that objective of a reason for that. It's just the convention. 
Uh, and so in web design, this is some the we've like developed a bunch of things around that like blue text means a link um like something that's circled and has rounded uh, rounded edges is uh like probably a button clicking on it does something and if it's you know if it doesn't have any of that on it then it's probably just text um so these kinds of like design patterns or like design conventions are really helpful for you and your users. It makes it easy for you to communicate with them without having to rely on documentation or pop-ups or any of the other sort of crutches that you uh, lean on when you don't have these things. So they're like, you know, I had to like, you know, trim this, this talk down a lot to fit it in the 20 minute uh, time limit. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the anti-patterns for language user interfaces because they're what's coming up kind of like first. They're the, the they're the clearest. Um, so I just wanted to like show the um, uh, a little uh, interaction between a uh, human and a chatbot therapist. Uh, and uh, so you know this is uh, you know human interacting with a machine. They're, they've been told like they're interacting with uh, with a therapist. And so the person brings up their uh, their boyfriend and like that they're depressed. The therapist responds like, I'm sorry, you're depressed. Um, asks a little bit about like, you know, what's going on in your family. Um, asks, asks about their father uh, and then kind of like asks a follow up question. What else comes to your mind when you think of your father? Bullies. Does that have anything to do with the fact that your boyfriend made you come here? Uh, so if you look at this, you might think, wow, this is like a pretty good chatbot therapist here. Um, like uh, it's like got this great therapeutic insight that maybe this person has like some toxicity in the way that they interact with uh, masculine figures in their life. Um, but that chatbot in that interaction is the one of the first chatbots ever back in the 60s, Eliza. Um, this uh, Eliza was sort of designed to try and pretend to be a psychotherapist. Um, and this this style of interaction, this Rogerian psychotherapy interaction that Eliza was di designed to mimic was chosen because it allowed the machine to say as little as possible and to just repeat back the person. And then the person who is interacting with the machine kind of fills in all of the gaps, fills in all of the missing sort of like humanity intelli and intelligence um, that would normally be present in like an interaction with a human. Uh, and so that like, this is something that humans are like very, very prone to. Uh, uh, the version of it for images is pareidolia, seeing images that are not there. So all of these images, you know, we see a face there, even though there is not a face. We want to see humanity in inanimate objects and in simple things. Uh, and this also applies to, uh, to things that have a language model, things that have artificial cognition in them. Uh, and so when we design our language interfaces, we want to make sure to avoid like triggering people's pareidolia. Um, and the reason there's like many reasons why I think the simplest way to think about it is that it's like those doors. It's like this mismatch of affordances and signifiers. These systems are not yet capable of like doing all the things that a human can do. Um, and so we want to suggest that they are still more machine like. So in, for example, in Copilot, it's, you know, it's, um, uh, this like background ghostly text, it looks like the autocomplete on your phone. People are used to thinking of that as a machine. Um, so that's like that's like our pull sign on our door. Um, then there are other people who are doing things like building this chatbot Alice that is meant to like pretend to be a person, uh, including, uh, you know, blinking, having a face, having a voice and like blinking and moving its face. Uh, all things that very much signify humanity. Uh, and that's like putting a per sign uh, on a door with handles, like you're saying it can do, uh, uh, can do a thing that it cannot. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways that you can go about this. Some like concrete suggestions here. Uh, the more that you like suggest uh, machineness than than uh, rather than humanity, the more uh, like you know the less you're going to trigger people's pareidolia. So what does that actually look like? It's things like choosing a name that's more like a machine or a system and less like a person. So chat GPT rather than Claude. Um, and the system, the system is often going to need to refer to itself while um, uh, while speaking. You could have it use human pronouns, gendered pronouns even. Um, but that is going to suggest um, humanity to people. Alternatively, 
like you having the system refer to itself as a system or it the way you would in the documentation for a system um, is going to signify like machine likeness. Um, the, if the interface is more textual and less voice like, that's also going to suggest uh, like uh, being a machine rather than a person. Um, the like simple things like the font can also change these things. Like if you use monospace font, the the sort of like signifier of, of code and, and machine identifiers that can help a ton um, as opposed to like printed or even like handwritten, like sort of fake, uh, fake handwritten text. If you do use a voice, um, like leaning into things like voice cloning, getting fillers, pauses, the, the things that uh, people have uh, when they speak, that's going to suggest more humanity than um, than a like directly synthesized voice that sounds like a computer from the 80s. Uh, and if you've ever interacted to give like one more example of why you might um, like prefer signifying machinists rather than humanists, uh, like systems like Alexa and Siri have these like very nice voices have these very like even human seeming voices uh, but then they don't have human seeming intelligence and this causes a ton of frustration for users um, including me uh, that like you get into this feeling like you can talk to it like a person because it talks like a person um, but then it doesn't have that same intelligence in response. Uh, so there's other people who have sort of like dialed in on this about like it's important to set expectations with your users carefully in the like in the design of your system in the onboarding for your system. Uh, and so Eugene Yan has written a little bit about this and has written all their really nice things about kind of like design and language models. Um, OK, so that's it for sort of like anti patterns and bad ways to uh, uh, design uh systems with language user interfaces let's talk a bit about um some of the good ways to design things um and github copilot is one of the most successful uh language model powered products github copilot um is uh integrated with vs code and can suggest um like completions or uh you know code chunks for you um and in addition to being a um yeah, in addition to being one of the most successful products, it's also one that the creators have actually spent a lot of time kind of like talking about how they built it and sort of sharing what they learned. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to, you know, sort of like leapfrog and uh, and learn from their mistakes. Uh, so Nat Friedman has spoken about this like at, at length in multiple places. Um, one of the best ones that I could find online um, was this scale AI talk. Um, so definitely check that out if this section is of interest to you, like hearing him talk about it, um, like for, you know, for half an hour is, is obviously better than, than me talking about it for two minutes. Um, uh, so definitely check that out, but synthesized, um, I'll say this, the, the, like in the beginning of, of, of this, uh, product development, they were like, okay, we want to do something with language models that can, that can do code. And we want to have it like integrated into our development environment, integrated into VS code, uh, maybe GitHub. Like we have these, um, we have all these places we could integrate, like where, what, how are we going to use it? So there were a couple of obvious ideas from the start, um, which are like, PR bot, like something that will scan your repo and make suggestions for improvements the way that already happens for dependency security issues with depend a bot or things like that. Um, another one was sort of like a stack overflow in your IDE experience where you type a question and you get a response, uh, like answering a question you have about code in the context of your code base inside your editor. Um, and then the last idea that they had was this like better autocomplete, uh, which is kind of like IntelliSense or or text completion-y, um, but like just smarter, powered by the latest language models. Um, and in uh, like they were able to get these three ideas to an MVP in like a weekend of engineering, maybe each. Um, so like very quick. And right now, you you know, if you go on Twitter, LinkedIn or, or GitHub, you'll find a lot of people putting together these kinds of MVPs for these kinds of features in a single hackathon in a weekend um, and uh, and 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 sharing that they had success. Uh, and each of these things had like different potential impact, but also different requirements. So if you are doing something like a PR bot, uh, like you really want to be right when you open a PR, like it's very frustrating to get bad PRs from people, um, but you don't have to be fast. Um, but if you're doing autocomplete, 
you really want to be fast because you want to be faster than a person can type it, maybe faster they can even type the next letter, um, but you don't necessarily have to be right all the time. We're used to ignoring autocomplete. Um, and so they did some user research and that revealed that the primary challenge was the accuracy of the models. It was really, really hard to get that super, super high accuracy that something like a PR bot or a chat experience required. Um, and so they found there was this like long tail of like every once in a while it would be this huge time saver. Um, and then like most of the time it would be like kind of just met or even like a time waster uh, to use their uh, to use one of their language model powered products. Uh, so they, so looking at that, it was like, okay, so we can't get the accuracy up to these like super high levels, but maybe we can like with engineering, we can really pound down that latency requirement, uh, or pound down the latency to match that hard latency requirement. So they like doubled down on the autocomplete. Um, and that was the product that eventually became Copilot. These other products are kind of coming now later, um, with Copilot X. Uh, so then the second phase after like, getting it up and going in a weekend was months of this like painstaking user experience research to do things like uh, A-B testing of a bunch of features, um, which was uh, to, um, uh, and with A-B testing, you want to like pick good metrics, right? It's one thing to say like, oh yeah, we definitely want to like A-B test these features. Like, how do I know whether a feature is good or not? It's not just my instinct. It's uh, it's a number. Which is what are those numbers? So the like one thing that I really liked is they combined two metrics that they tracked um, like, and both were used to make decisions. One was just acceptance of completions. That allows you to check like, are you providing useful information to people? Are you doing it like quickly enough? Um, and so that's that's a nice metric. but that misses all the people who are not even using your product, so they don't even get a chance to either accept or reject a completion. So they also looked at product stickiness, and they looked at retention 30 days after the person has started using the product. Um, and so that's like, that's a pretty hard metric. And, you know, it takes a lot of discipline to like sort of force yourself to like wait that long to get information. Um, but it, um, but it's something that they found was super critical for figuring out things like the, you know, that it was really important to make sure that this thing was like in the background so that people barely even noticed that they were using it. Otherwise, they would get frustrated with it and like kick it out. Uh, if they didn't get frustrated with it, eventually they would have one of those aha moments where it saves them like 20 minutes. Uh, and then they would get interested in actually learning how to use the product, learning how to like kind of prompt it, learning how to interact with it. Um, and yeah, I think those are the kind of the most important uh, like takeaways there. Do A-B testing with the right metrics. Um, and then like maybe something we also saw in, in that quote from Eugene Yan, sort of like find ways to allow it to be like easy to dismiss, be in the background, et cetera. Um, and there was a question from Niraj about the models that were being used in building K GitHub Copilot. Yeah, so this was, these were open AI models. They had like early access to open AI models, which is also a very helpful thing. If you're going to be building a feature, you can get out ahead of the competition um, if you have early access to these models. But actually maybe um, uh, relevant to that, sort of the bias of a lot of AI researchers, that's where I came from, that's where a lot of the people at open AI came from, um, is that like the the right th the important thing is accuracy. I want to make a model that's as smart as possible. But what they found was that every time that they like rolled out a bigger, slower but smarter model that like had ninety five percent completion acceptance rate, like that would have negative impacts on other metrics. Um, and people cared much more. Uh, and the like latency was the more critical thing because like fast latency means you get lots of shots on goal. And so then the total number of acceptances and the total amount of value delivered to a user was actually higher with less intelligent models. Um, and the like result of this was this product that is like very much beloved. Lots of people really like using Copilot. Lots of there's like open source efforts to create like a version of Copilot that uses open models and interacts with open editors, like because this is a clearly successful product and something that developers really like. Um, and so, you know, they were able to build this highly successful uh, product by doing this like careful design process. Um, so I'm conscious of the time. I know we wanted to have like, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes. So I'll just close out by saying, uh, like right now people are really focusing on like developer tooling, web, uh, web applications. These are the easy things to build with language models, but the most interesting things to build with language models are probably like more long horizon things. Um, one of the problems and the thing that's like sort of most exciting, uh, for me right now is robotics. Um, the, 
the, uh, one of the problems for making useful robots is you want them to be usable in kind of like general situations, not just like not just uh, doing like one simple task to make a robot do it to do one simple task, something we can kind of already do, but we struggle to use them in general in a general setting because as Polka Agarwal of MIT put it, it's like we need to get the humans to transfer their knowledge to the robots. Um, and so right now that's done via these interfaces like, um, you know, like for like a uh, um, either like a like text interface or like a traditional application interface. So you can see this in things like Spot, self-driving cars, in a Roomba, and these things are not very easy to use and they're not very flexible. Um, there's research ongoing um, right now at some of the large tech companies, including Google and Meta and elsewhere on making robots that you can do things like just say like hey i just uh worked out can you bring me a drink and a snack to recover you don't have to remember what's in your fridge you don't have to integrate your fridge with some smart fridge tracking technology so that it can talk to your robot you can just say the same way you would to a friend um or a domestic servant i guess um bring me a drink and a snack and the robot figures out how to do it so there's a lot of things required to make this work so this is not something you can like ship in like two months right now um there's multimodality there's like concerns of on-device inference network inference um like safety reliability um but this is like on a couple of year time scale one of the really really interesting problems in user interface design is going to be like how do you make a good interactive interface based off of language for something like a robot um, all right, so to wrap it up, just like uh, overall um, language user interfaces, new way to interact with computers unlocked by large language models. It's like like fundamental technological discovery. Um, they really badly need design. Um, we're already seeing these anti-patterns emerging really quickly. Um, and uh, you can learn how to do some of that design, how that how that process works from people uh, like the team that built a co-pilot. Um, and there's lots of opportunities, not even just in like the six months, next six months, but in the next like decade on sort of mastering these skills. Um, and I'll just close out uh, by saying um, this talk was originally given at the full stack large language models bootcamp. You can learn more about it at that QR code. Um, it was also a joint talk with uh, Sergei Karyev, um, who um, is, yeah, uh, has really, uh, changed my thinking on design. Um, so definitely check out some of uh, the things that he has written and done. Um, and we're not, it's not just about design, the large language model bootcamp. There's lots of engineering stuff, operations, um, and uh, like project building and all that kind of thing. All right. Cool. Um, do we have questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Charles directly if you want. I actually wanted to um, uh, ask you, Charles, about a couple of things regarding your presentation. When you mm -hmm. were talking about anti-patterns, oh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I will ask my question later. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, can I, can I, uh, I was typing it, <laughs> uh, um, typing my question. Okay, you can, yeah. Um, so, uh, my question is this, is there some sort of ontology of like, you know, different types of uh, user interfaces that people have built or people have sort of like converged upon for different uses that you might put a large language model to? So, for example, like, you know, if you're writing code, um, I want the large language model to produce like structured JSON output. What would be like a good UI for that? Or, uh, you know, I want I want this large language model to like formulate formulate. Um, an API request and then execute it. Like, you know, is there some sort of like a, just a place where you can go and look up, look up what people are doing? Um, yeah, I don't think that it's gotten sufficiently like figured out that there's a place that you can like, you know, just look up the answer the way that you might be able to with like web UIs or other stuff. Um, so uh, the, um, so I think that like that ontology is still emerging. I would also say narrowly the thing that you brought up, which was um, like showing structured JSON output is like pretty hard. Yes. Um, so that's like a particularly challenging one. Um, like, yeah, like I, I even struggle with like, you know, displaying JSON inside of like 
Um, I write a lot of like tutorial Jupyter notebooks about how to um, you know build things with uh, neural networks. And the JSON is always like the hardest thing to thing to display. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that. I'll say like one thing that I cut for time to make sure we'd have time to actually do these interactive question and answering was from the original version of this talk, some stuff about what the um, like patterns are for language user interfaces. Uh, so like the primary ones that uh, we identified were things that look like kind of like highly like interact, like very active click to complete where you like type stuff and you click a button um, to um, uh, to like actually trigger the language model to do stuff. Um, the That's been kind of deprecated. That was like mostly the open AI playground, the kind of like original interface. It's the most obvious thing. Text goes in, text comes out. You start off with like a Python function that does that. You turn that into a button. Um, like since then, people have moved on to things like autocomplete, like the copilot style, um, a more command palette style where you can like choose from a set of options, which is what like Repl.it and Notion use. Um, and then chat, one on one chat is kind of the one that most people have moved towards, like inspired by the success of chat GPT um, and uh, sort of like kind of pushed in that direction by the fact that the language model providers have moved in the direction of chat tuned models. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of like. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a full on ontology. There's not any layers and I don't think it covers the whole thing, um, but that's the the closest thing. You know, it's a little bit of a distinction if the large language model itself is your product or if like you're building a product that's enhanced by it. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Niraj. Yeah, there's like large language models, I think, are like databases. There's like a small fraction of people for whom like the actual technology itself is the differentiator. And a lot of those people need to spend like a ton of time on R&D and they get spun out of universities the way these like Apache licensed uh, database technologies do. And then everybody else just like, has features that happen to use a database, but that's like maybe not that important to the user. Like, I don't care whether somebody is like hitting Redis or not <laughs> when I'm like interacting with their website, I care about their website. Uh, so most of this was oriented at people who are using language models to deliver features inside of their products. Maybe it's a core feature of the product, um, but still it's like the language model is like kind of back of house stuff. Actually, on a related note, I see Abdul Karim asked a question, but he can't unmute himself. Uh, he asked if there's an Apple human, if there are Apple human interface guidelines or Google design, like material design elements for, for these kinds of UIs. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I want to say that the answer is actually yes, but I don't have the links. Like, it's not as developed as the things that you have for, like, you know, web web interfaces, mobile interfaces that have been around for it since the late 90s, 2010s. So, like, yeah, you can just, like, download the literal design elements that these people use and then just use them yourself. Um, I think that there are some... Yeah, there's some guideline -y level stuff um, available. I will look that up and send it to Sophia to share it with folks. If anybody is able to like find it, um, I want to say that Microsoft has written about this, like because they have early access to the open AI models. Um, and uh, that would be the primary one. And then maybe also Google. Cool. I see a question from Jay. Uh, he's asking that, you know, voice interface was a big thing a few years ago. Does mm -hmm. any of the user experience work in that space to help shape the interaction design for LLMs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, mostly my, how I have heard those like voice interfaces. So if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the like voice interfaces we're talking about are things like, Siri, um, Alexa, um, those kinds of things. Um, and most of the time what I hear is that the thing that made those products like less sticky and less successful than, than maybe the designers hoped was that the things were not like smart enough and capable enough of handling like a language interface. So that um, that is something that language models might be able to help with. There are a couple of blockers on that. One is that you need super fast inference in like a voice interface. 
like with text, I'm used to like waiting a few seconds for a coworker to respond. Um, but, uh, you know, or maybe even a few minutes. Um, but not so much with voice. Like if I'm speaking, I want to be spoken back to like pretty much immediately. Um, and like turn taking in a vocal conversation is also challenging. Um, then yeah, like, yeah, there's like the those latency problems like are related to also like, could you even, you can't really run a large language model on an Alexa. Um, it's like too um, resource intensive. And so that's maybe something that will change over time as the amount of compute and the amount of cost required to get a given cognitive capability decreases as it has decreased in the last like year or two. And um, then the last piece is that the language models right now mostly need to get, like they need to get text input and it is hard to turn sound, you know, like audio human speech into text. And there are, that's maybe something that a really smart language model can sort of like learn how to handle bad transcripts the way that humans can do when they're looking at bad transcripts. Um, but it is, it's surprisingly hard to get like that last mile of high quality in a transcript. Um, and especially when you're in like a noisy environment with lots of distractors, um, when you're in like a cocktail party problem type, uh, scenario. So, um, yeah, so those are all things that make it a little bit challenging to use the language models there. Um, yeah. Uh, I see a question from Nick. Do you think about autonomous agents? Basically, are auton is autonomous agencies the next big thing, in your opinion? Yeah, um, so on a short time scale, it feels like doing stuff with agents yeah, maybe it's important to like get actually a definition of like, you know, what is an agent? So we make sure we're talking about the same thing. So for me, an agent is something that can pursue goals in an environment. Um, and that usually means that means like a language model that doesn't just put out output text that lands in some chat or some browser window, but something that like can call an API that can interact with the tool. Um, and in order to pursue goals, they often also need kind of like reasoning and planning. And in order to work over, like pursue goals that are longer than like a few seconds, they need long-term memory. So agents kind of mix together planning, tool use, and memory. Each of those things are on their own, like they're not direct features of language models. Um, they are things that kind of arose by accident or arose as like patterns for working with language models. And they, so they each are like a little bit fiddly. Um, and that makes the reliability of these things really low, which is a particular challenge for agents because they're doing like turn after turn after turn, like they're re repeatedly operating. Um, so the, like, even like a 90% reliability, like, like plummets down to zero when you have multiple turns. Uh, and so that makes them it really hard to be reliable with agents. And so they are frequently just this like demo where, um, that, uh, yeah, that works for some cases and, and is not robust enough to be a sticky product. Um, but we already have seen, uh, that tool use has substantially improved with OpenAI's re most recent release of GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. Um, so that um, so the language model providers are already starting to knock down the things there. Other people are working on like making the retrieval better um, and making long-term memory work better um, at the architectural and pre-training level. And planning is also something that I would suspect we will we'll be able to solve. So I think on a short term, like, I think we're we're like going to maybe see like a a, a cresting wave. Um, but uh, on on agents where people get like disillusioned with them, but longer term, I think we will start to see uh, the reliability required to use agents, use language models to drive agents. Um, yeah, I'm actually wondering this like agents have this different components which are like really challenging to develop and probably unlikely like one company to develop all these components. Or you think it can come from like one giant tech company that has resources to build these components? Um, yeah, I think it's a matter of if this ends up being something that you 100% have to like pre-train a model to do, like you have to pre-train with retrieval 
Um, that's not obvious, but um, but that might be the case to get like really high quality like memory across thousands or millions of tokens. Um, maybe that retrieval problem, the memory problem is solved by just like um, moving to recurrent networks with infinite context windows, maybe. And so like maybe that's, uh, you know, solvable as part of architectural changes. The planning stuff feels like something you definitely need to like fine tune on or build like scaffolding around. And we've already seen with tooling that fine tuning like massively increases the robustness. So it is definitely possible for somebody like OpenAI, Anthropic or somebody else to like just to do this all via pre-training. Um, it's also possible, especially for retrieval, that there's like other solutions and these are like things that are solved modularly and then composed. Um, uh, I, th I think Nick has follow up question. Would it be possible to train LLM agent uh, like? Uh, yeah, one? yeah, definitely. I think that the large language model providers are certainly working on this internally, trying to figure out whether it, it works or not. Um, it's pretty hard to do training on agency. Like, you know, it's it's hard to learn reinforcement learning policies for agents because it's hard to do rollouts um, and uh, yeah, so that it is a hard training problem and I wouldn't expect like super fast progress the way that tool use was something you can anticipate like pretty fast progress from the model providers on. Nirit, you wanted to ask something? I see you, you raised the hand. Yeah, I, I was curious. So, you know, when you're, if you're designing an application that uses these models, um, you have control on the user side of things, but you also have some degree of control on the model side of things, right? Uh, like, you know, what inputs you provide the model, how you transform the inputs you provide the model and so on. Um, mm -hmm. What about, you know, when you're designing these interfaces, how much attention are people paying on the model side of things? Uh, and what are the what are the techniques that that people that you can use over there to like, you know, how much should the model be aware of the interface that it's like producing content for consuming content from, right? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a that's actually a great question. I think like right now, the language model, because it only does text, like it's going to be living in kind of like a different world than the user. And so you kind of like split these things off from each other. Um, I like, yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily like link the two to each other very tightly. Um, as we like already there are highly capable multimodal models, models that can actually like see images in addition to reading text. And that is something that could change the way you design the, the way you use the models. You would want them to actually maybe see what the user is seeing, right? In the same way that you get a much better like support well, experience. Like you if, have the Apple Vision Pro, right? They have, they, they, they're tracking your eye movements. And uh, if I built an application that used that, I could just say like, you know, what objects the user was focusing on. I don't even have to like provide a full image or anything like that, right? I can just provide additional context to the, in, in some format to the language model, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't know that I can think of any cases where that kind of like live information is provided to language models. Maybe the closest, like a kind of an analogous thing is in Copilot, sort of like recently opened files are used to like select text to go in there. So you kind of know what the person's thinking about. Um, or like might be thinking about. Um, but I think, yeah, you have like latency, like with the eye tracking, like that's a super, super low latency requirement. Language models are really gonna struggle. Um, so I think the, like the more likely thing is that you would share screen with a multimodal model in, you know, this is like a year or so from now before this technology would be broadly available. Um, and that would, yeah, that would allow the language model to have more information about what the user is seeing the same way that like, you know, pair programming with a shared screen is better um, than just like trying to describe it over text. Do do people think of these things as just learning dynamical systems? I mean, because that's essentially what these models are doing, right? They're, like you can encode any dynamical system as like a symbolic system, like you know, with a bunch of like uh, uh, rules that that uh, go around symbol manipulation. I, I'm I'm just curious if people are thinking about these things in this way. Yeah, I think for any way of thinking about language models, like there exists the like appropriate blog post or archive paper writing writing it up. Um, I think we're like, it's like the blindfolded men in the elephant, like yeah, you grab yeah. a piece of it. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about it. My preferred framework is um, for most, for many things, it's just text prediction. You just need to like expand your mind about what it means to predict text. And then that can be really helpful. That can sometimes cause you to underestimate what they can do. So the other framework that I like to use is the um, 
universal simulator. So this may be closer to what you're saying about simulating dynamical systems. Like it's seen text on the internet. Text on the internet is the output of a bunch of different systems in the world. And so it's learned to kind of guess how those systems work and how they might produce text. And by careful prompting and fine tuning, you can kind of like pull out specific sub systems, like the one that simulates a Python interpreter or the one that simulates um, a, a Reddit user or whatever. And so those those two things, like one kind of makes you overestimate them and one kind of makes you underestimate them. And I kind of like playing those two off of each other for, um, for understanding uh, both. And both of them have lots of nice papers, sort of like elaborating mathematical background on how to think about them. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a question from Jen. Um... Thank you for fantastic presentation. I'm curious about where you envision an onboarding chance, onboarding chat service to be positioned on the latency and accuracy team. I see. I'm curious about where you envision an onboarding chat service to be positioned on the latency and accuracy table. Okay, so we're talking like I've landed on your website. I'm starting to use it, and you've got like a pop-up window that says like, "Hey, ask me questions about your app." Um, that's like maybe helping a user go through a journey of like learning how the application works. Okay. So for latency, you don't have the, yeah, you're not in the turtle or the cheetah setting, um, using the emojis from the, from the table. Um, you can't afford to like spend 20 minutes deciding what to say next. Um, but you don't need to do it in like half a second or less or 100 milliseconds or less like you might need in autocomplete. And so that puts it more like the um, more like the stack overflow in your IDE kind of thing in that chart. Um, so you're like compete, you're basically like competing with humans um, who might otherwise so like deliver that to people. Um, so then the question is accuracy requirement. I would say that when you're first showing people your product, that's like a high accuracy kind of situation. Like the person is going to be like very intentionally, or, you know, they're, they're going to be very sensitive to like, is this a good product or not? And so like mistakes at that very early stage can be like really bad. Um, and so I would maybe consider that fairly high accuracy. Um, which might be challenging to deliver with language models. The ways to help with that, to make that accuracy requirement easier to deliver would be to kind of like narrow slightly the scope of the onboarding chat. Like maybe it's not going to help people with everything in the application. Maybe it's only going to help with certain things. And you can really like beat down all the bugs in early user testing to make sure in those like environments that are relatively narrow, but broader than what you would get from just like a point and click interface or something like that, then you can like, you can, you can bang down as many of the bugs as possible, get a very high accuracy um, and like deliver at human like latencies. So yeah, that's my, that's my thought on an onboarding chat service. Um, obviously, yeah, it's a, a complicated topic, but. Thanks, Charles. I, I have a question. So you, uh, early in your presentation, you spoke about the pareidolia, that we sort of fill in the gaps, right? Um, I just kind of share in my user experience, for example, basically, you, you, as I understand from what you said, when you perceive AI as a human and it's kind of dumb, you, you as a user, you have frustration, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't live up to your expectation. But for example, when I speak to ChatGPT, it's so good but I want it to be human. And when it says, oh, I'm just large language models, I'm like, oh, man, like, I just want to chat. I just, it feels like uh, there's nothing bad probably in pareidolia. And uh, if it sort of really lives up to your expectation, how it behaves and like, it's really good, right? It's really mm. kind of mimics human interaction. Uh, or, or you think uh, that, that industry where it's going, it, it sort of emphasizes, no, this is machine. That's why they call it it. They do the, they sort of through interface, they want to emphasize that it's not human. Don't mm -hmm. think about it as a human. Is this where like, the industry is going? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that the last six months, the industry, or like maybe even eight or nine months, um, like there's been a tilt in the direction of kind of like seeming very human-like. Um, you know, it, like maybe 
paradigmatically the shift from text completion to chat is like very much a switch from seeming like a machine to seeming like a person. Um, I think you're right that it is, it was, it's obviously great if you can deliver, like if you can deliver human-like affordances, then it's fine to have human-like signifiers, right? Um, and that's that's something that we as humans who interact with humans a lot have a ton of intuition about what affordances a human has, and there are lots of rich signifiers for those affordances. The challenge is that that is a very, very difficult set of affordances to provide. And so I like a lot of people get extremely frustrated with ChatGPT because of how high it signifies like a, a bunch of affordances that it can't have. Like it forgets stuff over time. Users get mad. Um, and so that maybe the, you know, the final resolution of this is probably neither to use classical machine-like signifiers, as I'm suggesting now, or to like lean into pareidolia as some people are doing, but to develop like a different design vocabulary for language models that suggests the kind of like affordances that their cognition actually has. Um, but that is like, it takes time to do that, right? It took time to develop a mobile centric design language, like five, 10 years. Um, it took time to develop a web centric one. So I think, um, I think it will take time to get to that. And in the, in the meantime, I think the safe choice is to lean to machine style signification, be defensive in your construction of these user interfaces and, and around LL empowered features and to expand outward from there. Yeah, sounds yes, it's so annoying because it's like uncanny valley. So it, you get like this kind of effect where you're like, it's kind of sounding human, but it's condescending. So you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Like, yeah, you are, you are bringing on a ton of baggage and importing a ton of of poorly maintained dependencies if you uh, if you signify humanity. Uh, do, you, do you understand correctly from the, your um, use case with Copilot that uh, uh, basically when they deployed the more advanced model, but the latency was longer, like people were frustrated. So basically users, they're okay with mediocre uh, kind of help rather than like excellent help if the mediocre help is deployed much faster if uh yeah so there I think, oh, we got a little echo there you might need to mute sophia oh yeah there we go okay um, um oh it's coming, it's coming. I'm not sure I'm who that is, that is but but okay, okay. are we good now i think it I think is it sophia, is sophia. 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 Are other people, people hearing, hearing this, this, this echo? echo? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so with in the copilot case, there's a couple of interlocking phenomena going on. You have that if you slide into the background, then people are less mad when you are uh when you're wrong because they it's easier to ignore things that don't like have attention grabbing features like really brightly colored text or something um when you in addition um when you are really fast you can like take a lot of shots on goal and you can um you can do it in response to like smaller user actions. So the user doesn't need to do some like very intentional thing to interact with your system. And then you get, um, uh, and you, because you have a short latency, you can respond to a minor user action like normal typing and like make a suggestion as it, like, if, you, if it takes a second or two, you need like a very intentional user action to trigger it. Um, so that you know that they're like actually going to, you know, pay attention to the, to the, to the result. Um, and so that, um, those things are like interacting. Um, and then the like final piece of it is that if you can take lots and lots of shots on goal with a low probability of extreme success, then 
you um what you get is this kind of like lottery ticket phenomenon where people will every once in a while get this like huge reward from interacting with your system. So like the image generation systems are kind of like this, like mid journey and, um, and playground AI. Um, and the, um, some of the, like some of the chat bots and text generation stuff are also kind of like this and that like that people people really love interacting with those kinds of things like lottery tickets. Um, and so you, people will put in effort to try and figure out how to increase the probability of getting those really big rewards. Um, and, but that's only possible if you take advantage of the law of large numbers, which means lots and lots of interactions. And if you like de-emphasize the failures, so that means like sliding into the background. Mm -hmm.